the Leading Edge Cricket Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Leading Edge Cricket Podcast, episode 21. Today we're going to take a look and break down the fifth and final day's play between New Zealand and England. The last day of the English tour in winter. Can they finally get a win? It's been a long time coming. As well as that, we'll take a look at day four of the fourth test between South Africa and Australia. And just how much humiliation are the South African team going to inflict on the Australians in this game? I am Rob on half of the Leading Edge Cricket Podcast. As always... I am going to say bright and early once again by Rich over in England. How are you? Yeah, hey, how you doing, Rob? I'm not bad, mate. We're good. You're good. You're always bright and early, and I'm always grand. So <laughs> we always know where we stand first thing in the morning. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, New Zealand, England, mate. What did did England get a win? Did they? Did they? It's been. We was looking at this earlier, and we was looking back at the stats to the last time that England got an away victory. He says, looking at his screen, and it's all the way back, 2015-16 in South Africa was the last time that England won an away test series. It's embarrassing, isn't it? So, and what was it? And the last overseas test win was October 2016. It was the single test. Against Chittagong, Bangladesh. Against Bangor. Yeah. Yeah. It's poor. They, they were dark days as well. We had Gary Balance and Ben Duckett in the lineup. So. <laughs> Whenever there's Gary Balance in the lineup, I just... Oh, I've got the remote in me and ready to turn it off and walk out. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Oh, buddy, oh, buddy. So, um, let's get into this one then. Match drawn. Wah, wah, wah. Oh. Um, England had such a great opportunity, didn't they? But um, just touching on something first, I've heard this morning that apparently it was agreed before the series started in New Zealand by the ECB that there wouldn't be any uh, alteration to the playing hours. Obviously, your clocks have changed. So yeah. uh, a 10.30 start is actually a, a, an old money 11.30 start. Yeah. It's so not, that's it's, not really... It's not clever, is yeah. it? No, and that's relevant to, to when we start digging into it. So as we say, match drawn. Uh, England, a noble, noble effort from the England bowlers. Uh, got, in, got New Zealand eight down, uh, but New Zealand were still 125 runs short at the close when bad luck did for them. Um, so New Zealand take the series 1-0. Um, I think we've got to say a deserved 1-0. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's let's run through what's happened today then. So so it got off to a lively start, Rob. Uh, first ball of the the day, Jeetan Ravel. He was sat on seventeen, uh, and that's how he ended. Uh, half full <laughs> and leg stump, um, and there you go. Caught Stoneman, bowled broad, seventeen off sixty balls. Uh, so that was him. And uh, you thought that was a pretty good start to the day. Well, it got better. Uh, very next ball, we spoke yesterday about his his key. Key to get Kane Williamson. It is. Well, Broadie got him next ball. First ball out, Kane Williamson. Uh, caught behind, bold broad. Golden duck from Kane Williamson. Now, if at this point you're watching, you are saying there is absolutely no doubt in your mind that England will go on and win this test match. Correct. You, you know, we said yesterday, if Ravel and Latham can hang around and bat for an hour, hour and a half, then England are in trouble. Then it's about Williamson. So you're thinking at least probably two sessions between those guys and England are done. Well, no, Ravel's gone. Williamson's gone. So that left Latham, and he was joined by Ross Taylor at the at the crease. Uh, Taylor lasted about another 24 runs until the score was 66 for three, uh, when he was caught by Cook off uh, Jack Leach for his maiden Test wicket. Get in uh, there. Top, yeah, top edge sweep from uh, new Knotts boy uh, Ross Taylor. So he was gone for 13 off 23 balls. New Zealand in trouble, I would say at this point. Yes. Um, Hen- Henry Nichols came in thirteen off twenty-four balls, and then he was caught. Cook bowled Anderson, uh, full ball driven, edged, caught by Cook in the slips. So a great morning for England, 90, ninety-one for four. Um, where do we go next? Uh, well, BJ Watling. Uh, so, so bear in mind, Tom Latham's still hanging around. He's doing well. He's working the ball around. He's showing that he can actually stick about. So BJ Watling, he lasted. He got nineteen off sixty-six balls, three boundaries. Nice and steady, uh, but then he went um, wood bowling round the wicket. So Wood Wood got a wicket, um, oh, no. <laughs> and Watlin what, what, he flicked the ball to, to kind of short backward square. Um, we'll go through the wickets in a bit more detail in a little bit, but that's a Wood wicket. Caught Anderson nineteen for Watlin, so that was scores at one hundred and thirty-five for five. Now the big wicket, one hundred and sixty-two for six. Tom Latham batted beautifully, eighty-three runs off two hundred and seven balls. Eighty-three is nice, but it's the two hundred and seven that's the key there. It is. So he's batted really well. He's batted what? What was that equivalent of about just almost thirty-five overs um, on his own? So that's a fantastic effort for Latham. He was caught Vince bold Leach, a so second wicket for Leach. 
Uh, again, big top edge on the sweep, uh, and Vince uh, caught caught uh, running in. And again, as I keep saying, 162 for six, six down. We must be there. England must be nearly there, Rob. We've got to be nearly there, especially because um, Tim Souther he's got a virus and probably wouldn't have batted. Really, he was. Oh, you, what can be said? Uh, Colin de Grandholm was at the crease, and he was joined by Ish Sodi. This is where New Zealand dug in and did to, to, to England what England kind of did to New Zealand a few years ago with Matt Pryor and uh, was yeah. it Monty. Yep. Yeah, so Colin de Grandholm played a, a relatively un de Grandhomish wicket uh, innings with uh, with a forty five off ninety seven balls. Quite watchful. Um, for him anyway <laughs> um, he was caught leech bold wood for 45 a short one pulled ouch not a good way to get out after you know you've done the hard work so so de went that's 219 for 7 ok Sodi and Wagner now you're definitely thinking England are in now well no this is not how it worked Ish Sodi and Neil Wagner went on to put on 37 run partnership in 31.2 overs heartbreaking Heartbreaking. Ish Sodi finished the day, 56 not out, 168 balls. He found the fence nine times. Wagner is even more impressive. Yeah. Seven runs off 103 balls, <laughs> one boundary. <laughs> I didn't see it, but if that boundary wasn't an edge, I'm going to be very disappointed. <laughs> Have you seen his strike rate? Yes, 6.79. Incredible. Awesome. awesome. And, the, and the worst thing for Wagner, bless him... He was given out LBW. He reviewed it. I'm not LBW. I hit it. Oh crap! I got caught a short leg instead. Yeah. Or silly point. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, so that for me, seven runs, 103 balls is one of the best innings you'll ever see in that situation. Yeah. Uh, and probably not good for the Spain paying public. Uh, but you know what? Suck it up. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't. So Isodi, uh, he was 56 not out, as we said. Uh, I believe Southie was Southie just walking to the middle when they when the umpires and uh, Root finally agreed that that was it. Bad light would stop play at just after six pm local time. Yes, uh, and that was the game. Two hundred and fifty six for eight of one hundred twenty four point four overs. Um, so England couldn't dismiss New Zealand in one hundred twenty four overs, uh, which obviously, as you got later on in the innings when people aren't really playing shots, it becomes a bit more tricky. But uh, but it's a disappointing one for England. Let's just quickly run through the bowling and then we'll, uh, we'll have a chat. So Anderson, 1 for 37 off 26. Broad, 2 for 72 off 24. Wood, 2 for 45 off 22. So at least he got a couple of wickets. Uh, Leach, first wicket, uh, wicketed innings, 2 for 61 off 32. Just under 2 and over. So that was a, a nice bit of bowling from Leach. I think we've seen something from him in this, uh, yeah. this game. Uh, 1 for 28 from 12.4 from Captain Root. Ben Stokes bowled four overs, none for two. And Dawid Milan also threw down uh, four overs, none for nine. So, disappointment for England. Uh, a really, really pleasing series win for New Zealand. Uh, the way they got this draw, I think, is exceptional. I think you know, New Zealand, they play it in the right way anyway. Uh, but to do this as well, to show this fight, this character is exceptional. And the pressure was on as well, Rob, wasn't it? I'm sure you'll go into it. But England at points had about eight men around the bat when uh, when Milan and Leach and, and others were uh, were twirling away. So brilliant effort from New Zealand. Yep, top, top effort. The first time they've beaten England in New Zealand in a series since 1983. Ooh. Yeah, massive. Absolutely massive for the team. Massive for Black Caps cricket. And it says a lot about the mental attitude of the players in terms of getting over the line. Colin de Grandhomme can hit the ball as far as anyone in world cricket, but he reined it in. Ishan Sodi likes to be attacking, reined it in. A couple of the top order will be a bit disappointed with the mode of dismissal. Latham out sweeping, Raval picking out mid-wicket, Nichols nicking off. It wasn't great. And BJ Watling wasn't great when he just flicked the ball to backward square. But the England team, they gave themselves a chance. They came out with everything that an England fan would want to see. Brody was on fire at the start, two in two. And you just, you could feel it. You could feel it coming. But the one thing that kind of stood out to me from this England team versus a la 2005 Ashes England team was the belief. The belief, they looked, as soon as there was a partnership, as soon as the Grand Home and... And 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 Sodi started batting Sody. for twenty five overs. You could just see the life sucking out of England a little bit. And then when Neil mm. Wagner came out, and Wagner's as mentally strong as anyone there is in the game, you can tell by the way he bowls. It's that piss and vinegar that I like about him. And he had it about his batting as well. He was just strong mentally. And 
England just, they looked a team that lacked the belief like they actually would win a game of cricket. And it was hard to see because they started so strong for the first hour, but as soon as they were up against it, they just didn't have, they didn't have plan B because plan 1.A or 1.B, let's call it, is to just bowl short. And they've seemed to have adopted that in this match based on everyone doing it against them. And it got a wicket. It got a couple of wickets. It got to Grand Home and it got Wattling. But at what cost? You've bowled 40 overs of short stuff. Um, and especially at the end against Sodi and Wagner. Stop bowling short against them, lads. There's three mm. pegs that the, you know, the first 20 wickets of the test match was taken by the opening bowlers pitching the ball up. Knock over them. Knock over them. They're not top six batsmen. Just bowl at the stumps and get the job done. Yeah, I mean, regardless of how well this show's done, apparently this is only the second time for New Zealand in a test match where he's batted over 100 balls, yep. 100 deliveries. So it's like you say, I mean, I obviously didn't get time to see much of this, obviously the time difference, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, bowl as if you're going to hit the top of off stump. If you can bowl that line, it's amazing how many times, oh, how quickly you will dismiss these tail enders. But if you try and bowl short, if you try and bowl all the rest of it, what you're trying to do, these variations, they tend to... You know they tend to be expecting the unexpected, don't they? Yeah. If you're just if you just say right, I'm better than you. I'm going to bowl an off stump line. I'm going to hit the off stump, or I'm going to hit the sticks, or I'm going to get you LBW or whatever it might be. Nine times out of ten, you feel like the, the the bowler will come out on top. Yeah. But obviously, it doesn't sound like England are, are kind of stayed with that. It, it's interesting, isn't it, as well, with the, the, the character of the two sides at the moment. Um, you know, not to take too much away from England. It's been a really long, hard winter. It has. Uh, these boys have been away from home for a long, long time. They've not had success in the Test Arena, so it's going to have taken its toll, you know, mentally, physically, uh, personally, whatever, however you want to put it. But um, England, when it got a little bit tough, they couldn't really find a way or find an answer to get through it uh, with the ball or, or with the bat in, in some instances. Uh, but New Zealand dug in. You know, they they were on a high, really, weren't they? They're, they're a confident setup at the moment, um, and and they were able to to kind of you know put one over on England, even though they didn't couldn't get a win in the second test. Yeah, very very confident team. Huge for the country to pick up wins like this at home. And the the interesting thing was the biggest cheer of the day and the biggest ovation was when Neil Wagner walked off the field after getting out for a, after a hundred odd balls. It was appreciated by the crowd. England and New Zealand fans both all stood up. The Balmy Army were quiet and they just, they, they gave him that moment of respect of well done. You stuck that out. You yeah. tough son of a gun. Um, England, Anderson and Broad as good as ever. Uh, there's one, there's one stat that I've been looking at. And it, I was going to give shout this one. I think you've seen the same one, buddy. Go for it. It hurts. Anderson and Broad took 47 wickets in the last seven test matches of this Australian New Zealand tour, an average of 29. The other bowlers took 34 wickets at 72. And I know Mark Wood took two wickets here, but he was erratic in the test match. It, there's a glimmer of hope that he could be something more, but just bowling short tactic is not going to work on a constant level. And I think we may have something in Leach as well. So there's, there is a ray of hope, but as an overall seven games of the, of the winter, it's a very disappointing display by the England bowlers. Yeah, definitely. I mean, taking them one by one, uh, not every single one that's thrown a ball down, but just the, the main guys. Jimmy Anderson is ageless, it would appear. He's 35 now. He doesn't seem to have you know, any sign that he's slowing down. Um, you know, he, he looks as fit as you could possibly imagine a, a quick bowler to be. Touch wood, don't want to curse him, but he doesn't seem to pick up injuries. He can keep going. He should still be around for the next year or two, so we don't have to worry too much, hopefully, about Jimmy. Brody had a real tough one in Australia, but he went away, he came back to England, he got in the nets at Trent Bridge, and he's grafted, he's worked on his game, and he's come back really strong in this series against uh, New Zealand, and he's bowled really, really well. Took wickets in, in uh, key times, you know, took numbers of wickets, and yeah. also got good players out. Um, he's done well. Leach, I think there's enough, even in the first innings, there was enough there to say, do you know what, this lad's got something. We spoke about it pre uh, this series. There's been too many uh, players over the years that have come in, spinners that have come in, who don't look like they're ready for test cricket or they don't yeah. look like they've got the temperament for test cricket. They've come in. We spoke about the young lad Kerrigan, yes. who we don't really know much about anymore from Lancashire. Mason Crane, he's only a young fellow who had come back, but he didn't look like, you know, he was bowling full tosses. He was bowling half pitch, you know, half trackers, wasn't he? Um, Leach has come in. He showed control. He showed some grit. He showed some grit with the bat as well. 
Um, so I think you, you've got your three bowlers there, haven't you? Yeah. But where do you go next? That is the question. We've seen Curran, we've seen Wokes, we've seen Overton. Uh, Ball, Ball. it seemed everything was Ball's fault. He played one test match in Brisbane and that mm. was it. He didn't play again the whole, the whole winter, which was bizarre to say the least. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen too many players used and now Wood as well. I don't think the answer lies of that third seamer in what we've already seen. Wokes will probably do well in the English summer. But going forward long term, I don't see the answer in any of those players that they've picked over this winter. I think you're going no. to have to go back to county. And, and we'll speak about it in the batting in a second. But if I'm a young county batsman or if I'm a young county quick, I am going to absolutely hit the ground running. Because I know if I do, there's a damn good chance I'm going to get a call up for that first test match against Pakistan in the summer. Yeah. Uh, and then if I can keep my place for those couple, I'm playing India when they come across. Yeah. There's opportunities. There's at least one bowling slot. And with this, probably two or three batting slots that you know they've got huge question marks over. Yeah, they do. They definitely do. And it, like you said, Brody went away, worked hard, came back. Eleven wickets at an average of eighteen point five by the end of this New Zealand series from the two Test matches that he played in. Jimmy Anderson eight wickets at twenty five, and Anderson had a just an incredible. Uh, incredible yeah. winter he stood head and shoulders above anything else 25 yeah. wickets Brody I've just got to uh, just got to quickly say about Jimmy mate those stats do not do him justice the amount no. of times he beat the bat that's that's that does not do him justice at all sorry carry on no mm-hmm. Brody 22 wickets on the uh, on the winter but Brody had 11 in this series so just 11 in the ashes that's why he was struggling but only Wokes yeah. reached double figures out of everyone else and you say there's 140 wickets up for grabs across seven test matches Two players have got 20 wickets and only one other player got 10 wickets. It's a real, real shoddy performance. Shoddy winter by England and I do hope they find a fix. The interesting thing about this New Zealand series is there's almost as many questions as what there are answers because people have just given a bit. Like take take James Vince. Let's look at the batting. James Vince. Two innings, 94 runs, an average of 47 and a very well made 76 but still getting out in the same way, still making the same mistakes. Don't know if he's up to batting at three. I maybe wouldn't mind seeing him in an England shirt at number five in the start of the summer. He's definitely not number three. Stoneman, four innings, 160 runs, an average of 40. So every innings he's getting in, but he's not going to pass 60. And like we said last time in his career, 10, 11, 12 test matches, he's not progressed past 60. So he's got the ability to make a bit of a start but lacking the mental participation for the game to keep going, it's, it's 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 a difficult one to swallow. And then I can't even look at Alistair Cook's stats when he averages five point seven five in a series. Yeah, oh, it is, we don't. We just need to put that one out there. Just just forget about it, almost, don't we? And and Alistair Cook, he, you know, we used the comment about the uh, going away in the county season. Alistair Cook's number one. He needs to get home. He needs to get rest up. Like we said last time. Go and play with your tractor on your farm. Do whatever you need to do to relax. And then he needs to graft. He needs to get his head down in nets. And he needs to work on overcoming whatever this little niggle of technique uh, keeps getting him out. I mean, you know, there is a 244 not out in amongst this nonsense of garbage run yeah. uh, that he's been on. That He's still a class player. You don't score 244 not out in a, in a, in a test match, especially not one in Australia. Unless you have got something, and we know what you know how good Alistair Cook is. I you know love that fella, but he's got a graft. He's got to go away, and he's got to stop being a question mark. He's got to come back strong in this English summer, and he's got to score some runs. Vince, yeah, I'd agree with you if they're going to persevere with Vince, because I don't think we can change three batsmen. You know, I'm not saying Milan needs to go. I think he deserves to start the summer against Pakistan. Yeah. But you've got Stoneman and Vince at the very least. I don't really want to see both of them play in that first Test match of the summer. I want a young player to have come in and scored runs at the start of the county season and looked the part. We mentioned maybe a Nick Gubbins, somebody like that from Middlesex. There are others out there. We'll discuss it pre-Pakistan. Um, but, you know, Vince, maybe you can put him down to five. But then it comes back to the same question. Who's at three? Is it Root? Root didn't want to play three. So, OK, is it Milan? Is Milan then suited to bat at number three? Mm, it's a... He gets himself out when he gets going, doesn't he? Like Stoneman, like Vince. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a yeah. big problem. So taking away from the negatives, I think one thing we should do is put some praise on the people that's had a really good New Zealand Absolutely. tour, and and the ones that come up to me that's stepped up. Johnny Bairstow, he made that yep. superb hundred, average forty on the series, hundred and sixty runs, 
Um, actually, the top run scorer is 160 runs, so fair play to him. Stoneman <laughs> in second with 161 runs, but it's what Stoneman didn't do that's going to overshadow him. And there's mm. no one else from the batting that makes me go, that's a decent series. But then with the ball, you've got Brody, Anderson, great potential with, with Leach. And Leach was better in the second innings. We said in the podcast the other day, I'd like to see him bowl full. And I'd like to see him bowl straight and have a man under the lid either side. And that's what England did. And it forced the sweep out the opposition and created two wickets. So he's those three bowlers have come out shining. Bairstow's had a really, really good back end of the winter. One day as he was great. Test match he was, was great. But like we said, there's a, a hell of a lot of questions to, to go into the next series. Yeah, definitely. And that's the thing. I don't want to be overcritical here. You know, Stoneman and Vince have scored runs in this series. In, in isolation in New Zealand, let's, yep. let's forget about that first innings in uh, in Auckland, <laughs> uh, the fifty eight all out. But they have scored runs, you know. They are, the, but the question is, with the body of work that's come before, can either of them show that they can and they have the ability to actually go on and score more than a fifty yep. uh, in a Test match? And it's not like they're scoring fifty every innings. Let's get that straight for a start. Uh, you know, it's, it's can they go on? And, and again, it might be that we see exactly the same top order against Pakistan and England. And if they go on and make big scores, maybe this is what they need. They just need to just something just to open the tap, uh, and then it will flow. But uh, but we need to see that they're learning as well. You know, Vince is, is very. You know, we, we spoke about it too many times. He gets out in the same way too often. You know, he's got a, he's got a show change there. So so I, I I just want to credit New Zealand as well though. Um, they've been exceptional. De Grand Homme in the first game. Uh, Kane Williams is just a class act anyway Latham has showed something as well in this game they're showing that they've got a good side Watlin's coming in and done well De Granholm had a really good all round performance in this last te- in the second yeah. test Tim Southey man of the match performance with bat and ball um, we know about Trent Bolt we know about Tim Southey Wagner's got something you've got Sodi but when you haven't got Sodi you, you had the, uh, the young Astor lad yeah. Uh, so Astle, then you also you've got Mitch Santner coming back, so they've got options with a spin. You know, the only question mark for me really, Jeetan Ravel's not taking his opportunity at the top of the order. Uh, no. Everybody else in that team is starting to look like they're uh, they're kind of you know nailing down their spot. So uh, New Zealand are in really good order. Yeah, very very good order. I can see on my screen in front of me. There is movement mm-hmm. in the Australian South Africa game, and I am eager to go and get stuck Bloody. into the uh, South Africa Australian game because South Africa are in complete control going into the start of day four overnight New Zealand time yesterday uh, English time, and I can see that day five is underway, and it's it's an incredible test match for probably the English and the South Africans. Rich, get us up to speed. Well, it's been an incredible, incredible start to the, to the day. And I'll be honest, it would not surprise me if this test match is finished by the time we finish this podcast. <laughs> um, so just to get, get, you know, get you up to date, um, this morning it was 88 for three when they started. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at it. I think this game might be over very soon. That's another <laughs> wicket. Right. We started at 88 for three. I'm going to have to be quick here. Uh, they need, still needed 524 to win uh, Australia. Hanscom was 23 not out. Sean March, seven not out. First ball of the day, Vernon Philander, the man is on fire this morning. Uh, he uh, he gets Marsh nicking off to Bavuma. First ball, coin slips. Three balls later, Philander gets uh, Mitch Marsh caught behind Decock. That was his 199th and 200th test wickets. Take about so two wickets in his first over. Incredible, absolutely. Um, next wicket to fall, Tim Payne. He's been in like a bit of a limpet, hasn't he, of, yeah. uh, of late? No seven runs off 28 balls this morning. That man, Philander, again, caught Decock. Three length balls in the corridor, all gone. <laughs> Cutting them out. Uh, Cummins, he only got one, lasted 12 balls. Bold Philander, late in swinging delivery. And we've just seen Chad Sayers go first ball. Uh, caught Elgar, bold Philander. Um, so Vernon Philander is 100 for nine. Vernon Philander is now on six for 12 <laughs> of 10.2. Uh, Rabada at the other end is, is none for 16 um, and um, we have the chance of a hat-trick to win the game for uh, South Africa so just getting us up to date yesterday the day started 134 for free um, for South Africa South Africa then went on to repost a fantastic um, 344 for six to set uh, Australia over 600 now the reason for that was they've got some question marks of injuries for some of these bowlers morning mortal side strain etc uh, but what a day um just going through it, um, Elgar got 81 in the end. He was dismissed by Lion Court Marsh. <laughs> Not very helpful, is it? I assume that's Sean Marsh. 
Um, <laughs> then Faf Duplessis, he went on. He was he was unbeaten overnight. He went on to record 120 before he was caught Hanscom bold Cummings. Uh, 18 boundaries, two sixes. Quinton de Kock, he only got four uh, four or four balls. LBW bold Cummings. And Temba Bavuma was 35 not out of 40. And Vernon Philander, that man, 33 off 49. Uh, four for 58 for Pat Cummings and two for 116 for Lyon. They're only interested with the ball. Um, and then we went to Australia, didn't we? And they're now 100 for nine and uh, Philander's waiting to run in for his hat-trick ball. So let's see if we can wrap it up on this podcast. Yeah. Are you going to give us... Uh, Balls oh, on the stumps, but just back, patted back by uh, by Josh Hazelwood. Sorry. Yes, I was going to try and give you a live, yeah. <laughs> live go there. Um, <laughs> Philander's had a great game. That's nine wickets for... Let me just work it out. Nine wickets for forty-six runs in the in the game, off twenty twenty-eight <laughs> overs. Strike rate. <laughs> oh, just incredible. Plus, he got runs. He scored about fifty runs in the game as well. So he's having a a proper game. When I woke up this morning and I saw this score, where South Africa went on, got three hundred and forty-four for six declared, and Australia needed six hundred and twelve to win. I didn't take that as they're trying to rest the bowlers, which is a genuine reason Morkel's picked up a bit of a, a side strain, etc. I took it as taking exactly what the Australians have done to teams for years. And when they're on top like this, they don't want to finish it in, in three days, four days. They want to humiliate you. The last time yeah. that Australia are going to be in South Africa a long time, and they're going to lose by 500 runs. I, I'd love to know. Love to know. If you know, comment below. The last time that Australia lost by 500 runs in a test match. I guarantee you it is not in the last 30 years. <laughs> it's, it's just been incredible this morning, mate. As we've been recording, I've had it on in the background, and it's just incredible. Just a couple of the wickets just worth mentioning. I was trying to rattle through quick so I could uh, try and commentate uh, live, if you like, on the uh, on the hat-trick ball, but... Uh, that wasn't to be. Uh, Pat Cummins, his dismissal, that was an unfortunate one. He's tried to shoulder arms. He's, you know, he, Well, he has shouldered arms. Um, he's tried to leave the ball alone, thinking he, you know, that's the right thing to do. And the ball's just nipped back a little bit and took his off stump. Yeah. Um, Peter Hanscom's my favourite dismissal of the day. Another bold philander. A carbon copy of his first innings dismissal, where he pretended... Was he going to leave it? Was he not? It was a late decision. Indec- indecisive leave. He started lifting the battle to leave and he got a little bit of a late inside edge that knocked off his leg stump. Hilarious. I don't know what makes it makes it so funny when Hanscom gets out like that. <laughs> but he's done it twice. I think it's that just horrific um, technique that he's got pre-delivery. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of makes me happy to see him bugger up like that. Um, I think you're right. It's not, you know, yes, they were trying to just protect bowlers a little bit. But also, it's rubbing the noses in the dirt, isn't it? Yeah. Australia, they're going to they're gonna have the scars of this for a while to come. Um, South Africa, Australia, they've always had some tough battles, haven't they, over the years? You know, the old famous World Cup final and stuff. So, this is huge. It's absolutely massive for South Africa. They're on the way to becoming probably, arguably, could be the best team in world cricket uh, in test matches. Uh, there's obviously some rivals there. You know, <laughs> let's, let's not forget about them. But Australia, where did they go from here? Um there's talk of the Australian Cricketers Association potentially they're having meetings aren't they at the moment with the players that have had the bans <sighs> I really hope they don't appeal I really really hope they don't appeal because it's just going to make such a mess Australia just need to crack on now they need to get home and just start working towards whatever cricket comes next yeah. and see who's there you know Joe Burns did get 42 in this second innings so he's shown he's got a little bit about him um, Renshaw failed again so that's a question mark Hanscom looks questionable for me in the Test Match Arena even though he did start relatively well uh, and he averaged about 40 uh, Kawaja just worth mentioning he was unlucky he uh, he got outside uh, the sticks for but uh, big LBW shout and it was deemed that he wasn't playing a shot he was hiding his bat a little bit so that was an unfortunate one for him after how well he batted in the first innings so, yeah, we're nearly there. Uh, it's almost over. It's been a bit of an embarrassment in the end after Australia going 1-0 up. Um, it's going to be 3-1 to South Africa. And they've absolutely smashed the Aussies. Yep. Yep, absolutely. On, on and off the field. <laughs> <laughs> I still think the best part is where they're wearing Sonny Bill Williams mask, but that's not for me to say. Um, there is one yeah. thing I want to mention on Philander. And his, his test match record is incredible. 54 matches, 204 wickets, at an average of 21.41. There's only... oh, You're talking minimal guys that average about 20, 21 with the ball. You're talking Ambrose, Walsh, McGrath, Warren. 
um, yeah. real top level guys and Philander is at that level. And out of those 204 wickets, over 50 of them are against Australia. That is how good Vernon Philander is. Yeah, and he doesn't appear to be this, this dangerous, does he? But he just puts it there or thereabouts and nibbles enough with it. I mean, he's, he's nearly 33, so you know it's a shame that he didn't really get to test cricket a little bit earlier. Uh, but oh, do you know what? He's, he's just been exceptional, hasn't he? He, came, he had, did have a spell at Nottinghamshire for a period. So although saying that, he's had a spell at about five different counties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like we had him on our own. Um, so, uh, so yeah, he, he's been brilliant. And, and it would be nice for him to wrap this innings up with how well he's done. But Morning Morkel's bowling now, and, and the dream really will be for Morning Morkel to get this last wicket yeah. on his final Test match appearance. You know that couldn't be uh, couldn't be written any better, could it? If he can just get this last wicket, uh, he's got two for nineteen for the Test. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we'll, we shall see. <laughs> One big bit of news that we missed out on: there's been a new record set today. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh no, go for it, Jimmy Anderson. Oh, yes, I did, but go on. This is a good, yes. this is a great start. So with the last delivery of the 17th over, he has bowled more deliveries in test cricket than any other fast bowler. And that is incredible, because when I think of longevity in fast bowlers, I think of Courtney Walsh, Glenn McGrath, people like this. Anderson, you know, Anderson, when he burst onto the scene with his fast-paced action and a bit twisting, I was like, oh, he'll play for about six years and be really great and get injured. Well, he worked on, he worked on his action and he's the most incredibly skillful bowler, incredibly skillful seamer that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And he has bowled more deliveries in test cricket than any other seam bowler. Ripple for Jimmy, ripple for Jimmy. What, what an absolute stud. And this is what we were saying earlier, wasn't it? He doesn't seem to get injured. Touch no. wood, don't curse it. Um, you know, he just seems to just be able to keep going and keep going. I mean, the way he is looking, he, I mean, as a batsman, if you get to 35, you're starting to say, well, there's not much time for this fellow left. But Jimmy, he still looks live. He still looks as fit a bloke as any. He must be a bit of a gym rat. Uh, but he's just got that makeup, hasn't he? Just that body where he can just keep going and he just doesn't seem to pick up injuries. So long may it continue for Jimmy. Let's hope he just puts some distance between uh, Courtney Walsh in, in second place. And let's hope that that record stands for a long, long, long time. So uh, credit to Jimmy. Awesome. One of the best that's ever ever done it for England. Yeah, definitely. And it could potentially be one of the best that's ever done it in the world. So he's got 531 test wickets. Glenn McGraw has the most test wickets from a seam bowler at 563. So there is a, an outside possibility that Jimmy Anderson may become the highest wicket taker of a seam bowler of all time. There's a chance. There's a chance. If he does another couple of years, there's every chance, isn't there? So uh, fingers crossed that he can do. Um, just looking at the, um, the, the the test of series between Australia and South Africa, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because... We, we kind of spoke at the start of the season. I think start of the season, start of the series. We'd have probably said Mitchell Starr would have been the star man, wouldn't we? Yeah, it's perhaps. Yeah. Um, just looking at the top five uh, wicket takers: Rabada, twenty three; Pat Cummins, twenty two for Australia. Two. I mean, for me, two of my favourites. Uh, Maharaj, the spinner, seventeen. Um, Nathan Lyon, he's got one less at sixteen, and now Philander's jumped up with sixteen as well. So there's your top five. I think we said before Starks only took twelve. Well, only took twelve wickets for the series. In, in three games, uh, and that was after he took was it eight in the in the match in the first game, or eight or nine in the first nine, game. So, yeah, you know, it, it just shows, doesn't it? I mean, Morkel's then chipped in. I mean, he's he's blooming well as well. So, just just yeah, just out of interest, really. Just who's performed, isn't it? Really, and it's I was just South Africa have just completely outplayed Australia. They have incredibly. Like you look at the South African team: Markham four hundred and eighty runs, De Villiers four hundred and twenty-seven, Elgar three hundred and thirty-three. De Kock, 223. Heaps of guys over 150. Now, if I look at Australia, I'm like, Payne, 215. Bancroft, 223. Warner, 217. Smith, 142. Mm -hmm. Nowhere near on the, the same level. And unfortunately for Australia, exactly the same with the ball. There are five guys from the South African bowling team averaging under 20 with the ball. Five. Just top drawer, isn't it? Just absolutely top drawer. One of which is Dean Elgar, but five. <laughs> <laughs> Irrelevant. Irrelevant. No, it's, it's been a sensation. I mean, Morkel, yeah, 15, te uh, 15 wickets in three test matches. 
Yeah. You know, that, that's been a great effort. And that's been spread out, hasn't it? Stark, 12 in, in three, uh, but obviously it was nine for 190 in the end, actually. So he's only took three wickets in, in the second and third test. Yeah. Uh, Hazelwood, 12 wickets. You know, he's not quite performed. He's been steady, don't get me wrong, but he's, he's only took the 12 wickets. So he's averaging nearly 40 with the ball this series. Yeah. So, you know, Mitch Marsh as well, he's only took four wickets as the all-rounder uh, in four test matches, which is a little bit disappointing. Chad Sayers, 246 on his test debut. <sighs> not, not the best time or place to be uh, to be making your debut. To be fair, all yeah. with his speed. I, I saw he opened his bowling the other day at 121 k. Uh, yeah, like, this isn't going to go well. <laughs> no, it's very uh, coming. Uh, not coming. Uh, sorry, Curran, isn't it? Tom Cummins esque. Yeah. Um, from when he was bowling in Australia, which I didn't understand why he was being used. Um, going back to what we said earlier about just briefly touch on England, you know, Overton played. Then when Overton was injured, it was an ideal opportunity to bring ball back in to be able to, you know, a nice tall bowler hits yeah. the deck, bowls good lengths, good pace. Uh, and they they brought coming. Um, I keep saying coming, uh, Curran in, and um, didn't really understand that one. But uh, no. but uh, he's uh, it's interesting. He's just got picked up by the IPL, hasn't he? Yes, yeah. he definitely has. We'll cover that in the next weekly podcast. So yes, that will do it for today, guys. If you haven't already, check out the IPL preview podcast that is live on the channel and doing very very well for itself. Very, very detailed. There's timestamps all the way down so you can select whichever team you want to listen to and just ignore the ones you don't like. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, now is a great time to do it. Things are just hitting the road nicely for the channel and we're heading in the right direction. Anything else from yourself, Rich? No, no. I think we can safely say that uh, South Africa are going to win this test match. Uh, Australia, uh, they are just hanging on. Uh, but I don't think we'll need to do a podcast tomorrow to uh, talk about South Africa, Australia. Just just assume South Africa have won. That sounds good to me. We'll have a day off. <laughs> so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next time.